So we decided to test on the later day. It gives us one more day for him touring. I was standing in the back of the room, throwing something away and turning on the lights and looking forward and sort of being intimidated by my own slides. So <laughs> I, I sympathize with your position. Um, they're my slides and I was looking at them and be like, oh shit, that's a lot of information, that's a lot of words. So I am sympathetic to your station, but try to get those vocab words memorized. Again, just like learning a language, you know, if you're learning French or German or whatever, uh, getting the vocabulary down first and then getting some of that grammar down, getting that syntax uh, for later. Once the vocabulary is down, it becomes easier to construct sentences. They might sound a little silly the first time and then they get better and better and better. So uh, we're gonna finish up uh, amino acids today, nutrition, you know, fat, but mostly amino acids, a little bit of carbs, and then introduce AMPK, which is the primary inhibitor of mTOR, this negative regulator of mTOR. And then we'll finish up AMPK next lecture, Friday, and introduce applications, and then we'll finish up applications. And so having on the next lecture, and so having this whole map down is really going to help make those applications make sense and be able to understand the pathways that those applications take. Some stuff has yet to appear in the literature in terms of applications. Not every experiment has been conducted. And so there's a number of experiments that could still be run to show with particular combinations of amino acids, say or amino acids along with this supplement. All of these different uh, mechanisms, they haven't all been tested in the literature. And so some of the applications, you just have to use physiology, your understanding of how that map works. And maybe when you pull up your GPS, it doesn't tell you how to get from A to B according to the roads you know, right? If you're in your hometown, you know the shortcuts in your hometown. You're very familiar with the town you go to, especially if you like were a runner or you like rode your bike around your neighborhood or whatever. You know the little shortcuts through people's yards. So it's all oh, the end of this cul-de-sac. It doesn't really end. There's a little path. All of that stuff, the equivalent of logging roads um, that don't show up on a GPS or MapQuest or, or whatever. Um, and some of the applications are going to be the equivalent of that, where we're using physiology that we're familiar with, but maybe it hasn't been tested yet in the literature. And it's important to test it, but the state of evidence, some of what we can do is just say, all right, this is what physiology says. Um, you know, we have some studies in cancer cells. We have some studies in rodents. We have some studies in maybe muscle wasting conditions. Uh, you know, we haven't tested a bodybuilder uh, with a supplement um, routine, but you get what I'm saying. So as we get into, into AMPK, think of it as sort of the opposite of PKB. PKB or AKT, super anabolic, in most of the same ways that AMPK is catabolic. So earlier this semester, we were talking about uh, fat loss and lipolysis, mobilization of energy substrates, weight loss. We were talking a lot about PKA. I'm not saying PKA is sort of the opposite. It's the, it's the companion to PKB, the catabolic companion to PKB, but AMPK uh, might be more powerful than that as a catabolic enzyme. There's an enzyme that's going to obstruct anabolism and facilitate catabolism at the same time. Oh, uh, we'll have more team stuff coming up. You know where to find things, you know, transcription, translation. We'll talk about genes specifically, a couple of lectures uh, coming up on genetics and genetic expression and what that looks like and how it works. You know, the mTOR enzyme, you know, the upstream and downstream stuff. Um, the four major upstream, I would say activators, but there's inhibitors in there too, modulators. Uh, the four major systems of mTOR interaction, either promotion or inhibition, and the immune chemical stuff, I think you're good with that. The mechanical profiles, there's tons of room left. There are 
are innumerable studies that can still be conducted on mechanosensation, on mechanotransduction, on sensing a load profile and relaying that information into the cell to elicit uh, an adaptation of some sort, um, some reinforcement of the tissue, because this is all aimed at fitness. And remember, fitness is just how appropriate is a cell, a tissue, an organ, a system, how appropriate is a bundle of flesh to the stressors that it endures? How appropriate is that tissue to the loads placed upon it, to the demands it has to endure and overcome and thrive despite? A really fit body has a lot of tissues that are um, calibrated to endure the daily stresses. Now, the daily stresses might be exercise. The daily stresses might be endurance exercise or weightlifting or, or whatever it is that you're doing. Farming, whatever. That's fitness. And mechanotransduction, mechanical loading profiles are one way that the body is understanding uh, loads, understanding tension, stress, uh, needs, and calibrating its adaptations to be best fit according to those load profiles. And you know, the cadherins, the titan, the integrins, the alpha actinin is another one. There's a lot of proteins that have yet to be really um, elucidated, really explored. You know, the hormones, sort of classic hormones. Think hormone as a gland releasing a thing. Tissue, cells, cells release stuff, release proteins. Um, you know, these cytokines or myokines if it's coming from muscle. Um, you know, IGF-1 comes out of a lot of stuff, comes out of muscle, comes out of fat, comes out of the liver. IGF-1 comes out of a lot of stuff. But if we think of hormones as sort of glandular uh, in nature, sort of purging IGF-1 a little bit from that, but uh, so classic hormone signaling, right? We have a receptor just you know, a couple slides ago, same picture. Right, where there's a cell surface receptor and these immune system, uh, all these chemicals, all these proteins that they get sent around into the blood, they have to bind to a cell surface receptor to relay their message indoors. That's PI3K right there. Um, and same thing with the hormones, unless you're a steroid hormone, then you just wiggle through and find your receptor inside of the cell if you're steroid. But if you're a polypeptide hormone, um, then you have to bind here. Um, unless your thyroid hormone is a transporter to get you inside. Otherwise, it's a cell surface receptor. Um, so immune, mechanical, endocrine, we're all okay with those. Um, so we'll do the nutritional one more time today, adding some additional detail, um, rehashing some of what we, what we talked about. And then hopefully at the end of today, the nutritional stuff, we can close that book and um, and then we'll just have one more day of AMPK, which is negative regulation. But beginning with fat, now lipids as an mTOR promoter, you know, there are, think prostaglandins are from arachidonic acid. That's a 20 carbon fat, fatty acid. Um, and so prostaglandins are going to be an mTOR promoter. And we can put that into the into the fat profile, I guess, phosphatidic acid. We can put that into the fat profile, but also your androgens and estrogens, right? These steroid hormones are going to have an effect on anabolism. We can put cortisol in there too. Cortisol is very catabolic. Maybe we'll get to that later. Uh, cortisol is a steroid hormone glucocorticoid from the adrenal cortex, very catabolic. So these steroid hormones uh, do have effects, but that study that looked at a low fat, high fiber diet and what happens to steroid hormones, endogenous, inside of you, normally produced steroid hormones. And Hunter, I looked it up wherever you are. There you are. Um, uh, I looked it up, it was eight weeks were the time. You asked you know, what the duration is, and, and I went and you know, pulled up the article. Um, there, there are these eight week uh, periods. So over the course of eight weeks, 
um, what we see is these lowering, if you go on a, a low fat and low cholesterol and, and high fiber diet, you're seeing a significant lowering, uh, both uh, uh, practically and statistically significant lowering of cholesterol, LDL and HDL, as well as testosterone and, and uh, DHEA and DHG and all of these sex hormone binding globulins, uh, the binding protein, estradiol, and this, this reduction in all of those things because it's steroid hormones or a binding protein associated with uh, steroid hormones. And if you don't have the ingredients to manufacture these things, because you're reducing your cholesterol levels, you would expect steroid hormones to go down. You'd expect to deplete your steroid hormones a little bit. And again, that's what we saw where there's um, this, the low fat and high fat diet, those are eight weeks. And at the end of each of those periods, remember total testosterone um, at baseline 15.2 goes down to 13.4. And then it bounces back to 13.6, not back to 15.2, eight weeks later, it's barely recovered at all. Now, over time, will it recover? Yeah, but remember in the weight loss diets, the biggest loser, that study that followed these people and re-studied uh, them years later and found that while they maintained some of their weight loss, they gained most of it back. On average, they, the, their, the weight loss was there a little bit. Um, but even after gaining most of the weight back, their basal metabolism was reduced to such a drastic degree years later after regaining the weight, their basal metabolism was still compromised, like terribly compromised and making it difficult to sort of ever lose weight in the future. So think about how diets have a permanent effect. It's not just an acute imprint on your physique. There's a permanent fingerprint that just remains on, on your frame, on what you see in the mirror and what your cells are doing. Um, now getting into the amino acids, so glucose and amino acids over here, mostly what we're doing, not exclusively what we're doing, but mostly what we're doing is transporting, translocating mTOR, the mTOR complex to the lysosome, to the workstation. And so these RAG GTPases and the regulator, um, the regulator of RAGs and mTOR regulator, um, getting mTOR to the work site. That's really what amino acids are doing. They're sort of fuel in the taxi, petrol or gasoline, whatever. Put that in the taxi or the Uber and let's transport mTOR to the workstation. That's mostly how amino acids are doing their work. Now you'll see the regulator also uh, listed as LAMTOR. Uh, and if you read the studies like LAMTOR one, two, three, four, five, who cares? Uh, regulator or LAMTOR. Um, this is uh, a way of getting mTOR to dock uh, at the lysosome. So we have regulator and then rag a has to be gtp loaded just think rag gtp loaded um in the same way that reb r-h-e-b ross homolog and rich and brain reb has to be gtp loaded so you see reb right here um, at the lysosomal surface you see reb and to get mTOR to do anything to get it to uh initiate translation you have to put it into proximity of red. You have to get it to the work site. Now, red can bind, I think it's like 184 amino acids, something like that. You can look it up and it doesn't matter. Um, the last 15 of these things uh, allow red to, to dock to the lysosomal surface. And then you have to get mTOR there. You have to get mTOR where red is. And so this regulator rag complex binds to Raptor. Now, GTP loaded. Right, binds to Raptor and then docks. It permits this ability uh, to dock. Once it's there in proximity to Red, Red is able to activate mTOR. Red directly binds to mTOR, uh, permitting uh, the activation of it. Now, 
a bunch of amino acids, 20 amino acids here. They're not all equal. Those amino acids are not all equal. Uh, some of them are great promoters of mTOR. Some of them are sort of weak promoters of mTOR. And others, mTOR just doesn't even really care about. It doesn't acknowledge them. The essential amino acids tend to do a better job than the non-essential amino acids. But there are some conditionally essential amino acids that are really important. Arginine, that's the second most important one for mTOR activation. Right, glutamine is also very important, but glutamine is weird in, in how it works. Arginine uh, works similarly uh, to leucine, in the same way as lysine, but arginine works better than lysine. Uh, and then methionine, another essential amino acid, is also very important. So those five, leucine um, and arginine, leucine is number one, arginine number two, and then from there, uh, I don't know, methionine maybe number three, lysine is also important, glutamine is important. But those five, the bronze medalist is up for grabs. The gold medalist and the silver medalist, those are settled. The bronze medalist is up for grabs, and those three are all candidates. Now, this is a study where you have know, no amino acids, and we're looking at the phosphorylation state of P70S6K right downstream from mTOR. Let's turn on, phospho let's turn on uh, protein translation. That's a kinase, the K, the kinase that phosphorylates ribosomal protein S6. And all 20 amino acids, yeah, we're going to get mTOR roaring, right? We're going to get this thing plus four. Um, just leucine and arginine, that's not bad. The two most important ones, that's not a bad activation of mTOR right there. Just leucine and arginine, uh, or and lysine rather, just leucine and lysine, not that good. There's something, there's something there. Just arginine and lysine, there's, uh, that's not really working. Um, leucine, lysine, arginine though, that's 90%. So you can really get mTOR activated without presenting all of the amino acids. You don't need the complete protein. You need the right representatives. If you're going to have a meeting, right, you send the team captains. If it's a sport, if it's departmental meetings or something like that, just send the department chair. Send the representatives to be the voice of the department or the voice of the team. Send the manager, the regional manager or whatever to the company potluck or, you know, send your representatives to be the voice for the whole. And that works really well. Now, the best representatives, again, leucine, arginine, lysine, methionine, and glutamine. Those are really good representatives. Other amino acids are able to relay a, a message, relay a voice. And so this SLC38A9, this is a sensor in the lysosome and it crosses um, that membrane, it, cro it crosses the lysosomal membrane and it can sense arginine levels in the lysosome. Now it also mobilizes leucine out of the lysosome. The lysosome are more degrading proteins. This is a pool of amino acids in the lysosome. To make proteins, we need a bunch of amino acids. You need a bunch of amino acids to make a protein. Where do a bunch of amino acids live? Well, in the lysosome. From whatever proteins you've degraded, you now have this fresh pool of recycled proteins and, and ready to contribute those, um, those aminos to a new protein. So it's no wonder that the lysosomal surface is where mTOR does the bulk of its, of its labor. Not all of its labor, but the bulk of its labor. And so this SLC 38A9, it does a good job of sensing um, intra-lysosomal arginine, arginine within the lysosome, mobilizing leucine out, and then uh, docking mTOR, facilitating the docking of uh, mTOR. And if you want the cell to know you don't have arginine, you have to block both this and castor, that cellular arginine sensor for TOR. Um, so that's the one that's out in the cytosol. So you have to block two sensors if you want the cell to stop recognizing arginine. There's a, there's a double um, blockade you have to put into, into that road. So arginine is well sensed by the cell. Um, now this is just showing that, so we have some, 
remember proteolysis. We're lysing proteins. Protein lysis, proteolysis. We lyse a bunch of proteins. We have an amino acid pool inside the, the lysosome. And um, if we don't have much arginine, low luminal arginine, we don't get much leucine out. But if you have a bunch, if you have a bunch of arginine in the lysosome, you're able to mobilize more leucine out. Uh, so there's one additional interaction between arginine and leucine. Uh, there are interactions between other amino acids too. Glutamine and leucine have an interaction. We'll, we'll get there. Um, and so the SLC38A9 sensor, it has several functions. Sensing the amount of arginine you have, that's one. Getting uh, leucine out into the cell, that's another. It's also not a very good one, but it's a sensor for lysine. Uh, it senses lysine as well, just not as potently as arginine. I said that you can, if you take like isoleucine in Cestrin 2, uh, that cellular uh, leucine sensor, you can, in that pocket, you can just cram isoleucine where leucine goes. Not well, though. You can't cram it in there very well. Uh, this SLC38 B9 is a much better lysine sensor than Cestrin 2 is uh, uh, um, isoleucine. Um, uh, sensor. Uh, but so we've got the lysine overlaps. You, you said it's a, a better lysine sensor, but it's a better arginine than lysine? Way better arginine. Yeah. Um, SLC 38A9 is an arginine sensor. Secondarily, it senses lysine too. Just not that potently. It's not that our lysine isn't that much of a stimulator. But did you say it senses lysine better than something else? It also has lysine better than pretty much everything else other than arginine. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, lysine is its runner up in, in what it can sense. But what, what I said was um, the branch chain amino acids, uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, Cestrin 2 is that leucine sensor. And so, totally different topic uh, out here. Out here. So, leucine, it's not really here, but it actually binds to Cestrin 2. Leucine does. But you can cram isoleucine in there, you just like a huge concentration of it. You don't get it in there. But this isn't really an isoleucine sensor. This is a leucine sensor. Cestrin 2 is. And really potent mTOR promoter is leucine. Again, the number one uh, we can get. Now, Kickster, remember, this is just let's get Gator 1 to the complex. So we can pretty much ignore Kickster. This is just get Gator 1 to the complex. There's um, a regulator. Let's do some docking, right? There's the rags. Rag A has to be GTP loaded. Just like red over here. Red has to be GTP loaded, right? Tuberin, TSC2, is going to facilitate the breakdown of that GTP. So it won't activate mTOR. It won't bind to mTOR. Release this. Um, inhibitor. So um, red has to be GTP loaded to activate it. So does RAG A, the RAG complex. You don't specifically need to know that one. The RAG complex needs to be GTP loaded. And you can break down that GTP. And Kickster is a thing that gets Gator here. Regulator adheres um, this to the uh, lysosome. This is involved. If you block this thing, think pH, uh, but you don't need to know anything about it. But the, the research on this is relatively young and and maybe not inconsistent, but but limited. Uh, but if you block this thing, you can block mTOR signaling pretty effectively. But mostly pH. But pay attention to everything else on this slide. Minimally pay attention to Kickstarter. Uh, but Gator is the primary inhibitor of amino acid signaling. It's not the only, it's a primary inhibitor of amino acid signaling. Kickstarter is just how it is here, how it, how it is on site. Gator 2 inhibits Gator 1. Gator 2 is an inhibitor of Gator 1. Cestrin 2 is an inhibitor of Gator 2. Leucine is an inhibitor of that inhibitor. So leucine binds to Cestrin 2. Cestrin 2 is an inhibitor of this, which is an inhibitor of this, which is an inhibitor of this. Meaning, 
deny us that leucine, and you're unable to have mTOR be at the surface, be at the work site. It's quadruple negative. And the same thing with arginine in the cytosol, arginine out in the cell. Um, so cellular arginine sensor for TOR, castor, C-A-S-T-O-R, arginine binds, that stops its inhibition of Gator 2. So Gator 2 can inhibit Gator 1. Um, so Gator 1 is no longer um, facilitating the breakdown of that uh, GTP of, of, of getting mTOR away from the work site. Cellular sensing of leucine and arginine are critical regulators of mTOR functioning. Mostly mTOR's localization, mTOR's arrival at the work site. That's really uh, what those things are for. RAG A, GTP loaded. RAG, GTP loaded. Okay, we have mTOR activated. If one of them isn't, just one of those two, they both have to be GTP loaded for mTOR to be on. If neither of them is loaded or one of them isn't, if this isn't, mTOR isn't at the work site. I don't care if RAG is GTP loaded, where's mTOR? How do I, how do I activate mTOR? It's not here. Um, if RAG is not GTP loaded, um, but RAG is, okay, let's get mTOR here. Well, where's RAG? I, I can't get turned on uh, without RAG. So they, you need both of these pathways. There's a double negative here. There's, there's inhibition on both sides and you have to turn both of these pathways on to get mTOR to turn on. Now, again, it's more complicated. We'll do a little bit more detail um, today than we did last lecture. But remember, there are other areas in which mTOR can work. The primary, do you guys have a gym that you work out at? A specific, it's like on campus, whatever, for like the athletes work out on campus, other people maybe you work out at Bond. There's in shape, I think 24 hour fitness, like went under, I think. But, you know, people have a gym. That gym has all of the equipment, has all of the resources, everything you need. Every piece of equipment, every um, plate that you could possibly need, the dumbbells up to a million, whatever. And that is a life zone. That's your home gym. Well, that's your go to gym where you can do everything you need, it has everything you need. When you're traveling, Let's say you're like, you know, the double tree by Hilton or whatever, Hampton, Inn and Suites, whatever it is. You're one of these places. There's a gym there. It's not a good one, but you can do everything you need. You can do everything you need at that gym. That's the alternative sites where mTOR is able to work when it's on the road. You know, oh, okay, it's not the lysosome. It's not at, you know, in shape or golds or whatever. Uh, but it's capable of getting its full workout in. So there are other sites, and you don't need to know the other sites for the test, just know the lysosome, because the lysosome is the primary destination where mTOR facilitates translation. It's the best gym that you have in the cell. Now methionine, really important. It's neither leucine nor arginine in its importance, but you know, this is a candidate for the bronze medal, is, is methionine. And this is, this comes from, uh, from methionine. This is a methionine derived compound um, that blocks SAMTOR. This facilitates this Gator 1 kickster uh, interaction at the lysosome. So if you're able to block, this is a direct, it doesn't go through Gator 2. Leucine and arginine go through Gator 2 to initiate their promotion of mTOR. Uh, methionine does not. It goes through SAMTOR. SAMTOR would be promoting this, this relationship between Kickster and, and Gator 1 and facilitating the uh, inhibition of mTOR, of the RAGs. And so this is an inhibition of this inhibition. Does that make sense from methionine? This is a good article that talks about it. Um, the, the binding of S-adenosylmethionine, SAM, just think, think methionine, 
uh, to Samtor. Uh, Aberdeen is the interaction of Samtor with Gator One and Kickster. So this, Gator One and Kickster. Uh, conversely, methionine starvation. We'll talk about this in the applications uh, section. Methionine starvation. Fasting doesn't have to be every single calorie. It depends what you want to accomplish out of fasting. Now, if you want to improve insulin sensitivity, you better get rid of your carbs in your fasting. But you can do specific amino acid fasting if, you're go if it's cancer that you're, that you're concerned with, um, if it's autophagy you want to upregulate, and methionine starvation, just don't eat methionine. That's a pretty effective form of protein fasting is elimination of particular amino acid, uh, and methionine is, is one of them. Um, threonine, now for, for people who are in stress phys, I've talked about a couple of supplements that sounded just like threonine. Um, I talked about theanine, right? Theanine is, is derived from glutamine uh, as a sleep aid, uh, or you can take it with your caffeine to get the jitters out. Um, so either as a sleep aid or to eliminate the jitters of your, of your caffeine. And I talked about magnesium threonate as another sleep aid. This is threonine. It's neither of those things, right? This is just the amino acid, uh, threonine. And TARS-2, so there's a threonine, TARS-2, uh, facilitating the uh, GTP loading of your, of your rep. So it has its own pathway. It's not a very strong pathway. Again, not all of these amino acids are, um, are comparable in their effects. Uh, Cestrin-2, Castor-1, Cestrin and Castor, very strong very effective. Samtor, pretty, pretty effective. Give you know, this TARS-2 stuff, eh, there's not, there's not that much, there's not that much of an effect here. So if you want, if in your post-workout supplements, your, your non-steroidal um, anabolic supplement, pre-workout or post-workout, whenever you want to take this, Feel free to leave, leave out the threonine if you want, but if you want to just maximize everything that could possibly have an interaction with mTOR, go ahead and include that one um, because it is sensed um, through the TARS-2 uh, and it binds to the inactive RAG-C, elevating the um, GTP loading of rag -A. So there is a pathway for which um, threonine is sensed. Glutamine, remember is weird. Glutamine is weird. It has a lot, it's sort of the wild card of amino acids. There is a RAD pathway with glutamine. Um, so this over here, this FLCN, that's called folliculin, um, the, a lot of amino acids are gonna signal through this. It's a weak signaling, um, kind of promoting mTOR signaling through a very weak pathway. Several amino acids go through there. Glutamine though, so, you know, again, just in addition um, to the amino acids discussed above, alanine, histidine, serine, and valine also have been linked to mTOR activation. And so there's, there are pathways for other amino acids, very weak. You can feel free to ignore those ones, but the cell does recognize um, some of them. This is that folliculin right here. And then that, um, that FNIP, so it's uh, FLCN, FNIP, it's the folliculin interacting proteins one and two. Um, and this is just a way of trying to get more mTOR to, to localize to the lysosomal surface. It's a weak pathway. It cannot compete with um, uh, SAMTOR, it cannot compete with a Cestrin or Castor or SLC3089. It can't compete with those in terms of its potency and stimulating mTOR, but it's a thing that sort of works. It's a weak signal. Remember when we were talking about the difference between MAPK and PI3K, of uh, mitogen activated protein kinase, uh, ERK, um, RSK, that signaling cascade, as compared to PI3K, PKB, mTOR. I said PI3K, PKB, mTOR, that pathway is the most important regulator. And I give it like a score of 12 to seven or something like that. In that 1985 baseball, there's that little picture of the original Nintendo game baseball on the scoreboard was like PI3K versus MAPK. Who knows what, what the relationship is, but um, again, leucine and arginine, those are just oh, racking up points.
I mean, it's like a blowout uh, with those ones. Methionine is also helpful. Lysine, also helpful. Glutamine, also helpful. But again, sort of a wild card. There's a number of ways. This is alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, when we we're talking about protein catabolism, and I think when we were talking about uh, fat catabolism also, uh, when we talked about the Krebs cycle, and here is how fat is used as a fuel source. Alpha ketoglutarate is a Krebs cycle intermediate. And so there's a pathway here. It's not outlined very well. So that's glutamine, this GLN, that's glutamine. And there's a pathway for the routes with glutamine. Um, over here, there's another pathway that's not outlined very well, uh, PLD1, uh, phospholipase D1. If it's mechanical loading, what used to be thought with mechanical loading in the earlier years of, of dissecting mTOR, um, people thought it was PLD1 doing out. Turns out it's DGK, diacylglycerol kinase for mechanical loading that does the bulk of your phosphatidic acid generation. But with, with uh, glutamine, you can't activate PLD1, phospholipase D1. And you can get, out of uh, phosphatidylcholine, you can get some phosphatidic acid. So through glutamine, we can see phosphatidic acid generation through a different pathway than, than you see with mechanical loading. Remember mechanical loading, DGK, diacylglycerol kinase. You take a diacylglycerol, and instead of hormone sensitive lipasing it, you phosphorylate it with DGK, direct promoter of mTOR, binds to mTOR, promotes it. Um, but you can get uh, PA, phosphatidic acid, in other ways too, and this PLD, phospholipase uh, D1, is the glutamine pathway. Neither of these is outlined all that well. Another function of glutamine is let's get some leucine into the cell. If you have a bunch of glutamine, you pump glutamine out as you pump leucine in. What is that? So if you have more glutamine, you can get more leucine into the cell where it can be recognized. You can get more leucine into the cell if that cell has more glutamine in it, there's a sodium dependent transport for glutamine to get in, but pumping glutamine out to get leucine in. Okay, so there's a relationship between glutamine and leucine also. Uh, and then remember the calcium stuff, the calcineurin, you get MAPK activation going. Um, there are relationships with amino acids and intracellular calcium. So where it comes from is from inside of the cell, calcium from inside of the cell, the endoplasmic reticulum, but also the lysosome. You can get lysosomal calcium release. So calcium release inside of the cell can turn on mTOR. Calcium inside of the cell can turn on mTOR. And a lot of the work, people are looking at leucine. Leucine to promote calcium inside of the cell, intracellular calcium elevations with leucine. And there's a number of different mechanisms. You don't need to know any of them. Lots of mechanisms have been uh, analyzed, explored, studied. Lots of mechanisms have been investigated. Now remember, to get leucine into the cell, it's a trade-off with glutamine. So there's a relationship with leucine and glutamine, which may partially explain observations of uh, MAPK signaling and glutamine. Um, intracellular release of calcium in the presence of glutamine and in particular cells. So sometimes again, you have to take, you're looking at mouse models and like, let's look at macrophages. Or, uh, so study by study, you build a more comprehensive narrative looking at particular cells and particular species, and some of the work is in humans. Um, but glutamine, as well as some other amino acids, leucine definitely does it. Leucine definitely increases 
uh, intracellular calcium. Glutamine does it. There's phenylalanine, there's cysteine. Some other amino acids seem to do this as well. Uh, glutamine seems to do it fairly potently. Leucine seems to do it fairly potently. In the end, what I would say, the five most important amino acids, the five amino acids that will signal mTOR above all others are leucine, number one. That's the gold medalist, cross the finish line first. Arginine, um, that's no slouch, arginine. It crosses the finish line, not much behind the leucine. Behind the leucine, but not that much behind. You can tell it's in the same race. It's competitive. And then again, the bronze medalist, methionine, sure. Lysine, all right, sure. Glutamine, sure. Those three, uh, the state of evidence, study by study, it wouldn't be too hard to support any of them. Go to the horse races. Uh, you put your money on any one of those three and, and have decent odds. I wouldn't put your money on any of the other um, 15 amino acids as being giant promoters of mTOR though. Those five uh, are the big ones. And again, the major function of amino acids, yeah, there's like, you know, intracellular um, calcium release and stuff, but, but getting mTOR to adhere to that lysosomal surface. Hunter, you have a... Um, so if there isn't a ton of glutamine in the cell, uh, will you see you can get leucine into the cell. Yeah, you can still get leucine into the cell. Um, it helps. It helps a lot to have a bunch of glutamine. Um, and so I have not seen the studies. I'll look before we start talking about the uh, supplements, but I'll look for studies on this particular question to see if I can find an answer. But if you take your leucine with glutamine, if you take those two supplements together, are you augmenting um, the effect of mTOR signaling? Is there a dose dependence relationship? Is there a timing signature to it? I'll see if I can turn up some studies on that before we talk about applications. Um, but glutamine definitely helps. So again, the major thing is to, for protein, for amino acids, is to get mTOR to the work site so that REB can uh, activated. Now carbs, that's fat and protein. Carbs work also. Carbs also are anabolic. Just to eat a bunch of sugar, you get an insulin release. Eat like six bananas. You're going to have a giant insulin release. Insulin binds to its receptor and you get PI3K, PKB, mTOR signaling. Right, you, you get AS160, also AKT substrate 160 kilodaltons. That's let's get some glute 4 mobilized. Let's get some sugar into the cell. Okay, purpose of insulin, get sugar into the cell. If there's a primary purpose of insulin, it's glute 4 translocation. It's let's get sugar into the cell. So PKB, AS160, let's mobilize some, some glute 4. Secondarily, with insulin, we get a bunch of mTOR signaling. So right there, we already have an anabolic effect of carbohydrate. In addition, low carbohydrate levels uh, inhibit mTOR. And some of this is through AMPK, which we're, we're going to move into. But there are also um, glycolytic um, you know, substances, right? This is an enzyme, hexokinase, right? The enzyme that does the conversion of glucose into G6P, glucose 6 phosphate. Um, but also, we have this um, glycolytic intermediate um, that helps mTOR activation. So there are carbohydrate metabolism interactions with mTOR in a carb heavy diet, a lot of carbohydrate avail availability, we have uh, more mTOR activity. So it's not just fat, it's not just protein. Carbohydrates matter too. And especially in a high carbohydrate diet where you see, like if people do carb loading, you have an endurance event coming up, you do a bunch of carb loading, you're gonna have more glycogen. Glycogen binds to the beta subunit on AMPK which inhibits AMPK. So glycogen itself, the storage form of carbohydrate is an AMPK inhibitor. And AMPK is an mTOR inhibitor. 
So by extension, glycogen is an mTOR promoter. Do your carb loading and there's some mTOR promotion. So carbs, fats, and proteins all promote mTOR. Your macros, each one of them promotes mTOR in different ways. The critical nutrient to get into your mouth is amino acids. That's the critical one to eat. If you have to exclusively eat one nutrient for the rest of your life, go with protein. Go with protein. Don't just eat protein for the rest of your life. But if it's, you know, you're in like the Alps, your plane crashed, and you get to pick one energy substrate for a you know, period of months or something, definitely pick protein. Give, give, give someone else the carbs. Um, fat would be helpful, but, but you need that protein. Um, so uh, the, the major sensors, right? Here's the, this says insulin, but tons of stuff does this. IGF, whatever, tons of stuff is gonna do this. And this is the PA3K, PKB pathway. Okay, over here we got MAPK, right? Um, MEK, MAPK, a mitogen activated protein kinase pathway, lots of, of interactions and downstream uh, convergence between these two pathways, lots of overlap, cross rest. Now here's AMPK, it says energy stress. Energy stress just means ATP to the other ones ratio. ATP to ADP, ATP to AMP. That ratio, that's what energy stress is. And as you lose ATP, you accumulate ADP and you accumulate AMP. And the more of those you accumulate, that ratio changes. The ratio of ATP to ADP and AMP, that changes. And as ADP and AMP climb, AMP really climbs, as, as, as those go up and ATP goes down, ATP doesn't go down that much, but ADP goes up more than the amount of ATP changes and AMP goes up way more. As those ratios begin to change, you activate AMPK. And AMPK uh, does a lot of things, right? Phosphorylates a lot of things. It too is a kinase. AMP, adenosine monophosphate, AMP activated protein kinase. Uh, and so as a kinase, it phosphorylates stuff. One of the things is tuberin to promote it. Uh, it phosphorylates raptor to inhibit it. It also phosphorylates mTOR directly. Um, but, but AMPK phosphorylates a lot of things and they're, it's, it's catabolic. And then amino acids, you see RAGs. So if there's a, you know, a, a RAGs to riches cliche to be made, it's with amino acids. Uh, GTP loaded RAGs. Let's, let's get mTOR to the workstation, to the work site. And then you know all this stuff. There's MLSD or Gable, right? There's a Raptor, there's Press 40. Deptor isn't here, but there's 4 ebp one the P70SXK, REB is directly binding to mTOR, um, tuberin is facilitating the breakdown of the REB's GTP, so we can't uh, activate mTOR. Now getting more into AMPK, again we see uh, LKB1, liver kinase B1, and skeletal muscle, that's the primary promoter of AMPK. In the, AMP, I guess, would be the primary promoter. The thing that turns it on, though, AMP permits LKB1 to, to activate AMPK. LKB1 in muscle and in liver, but uh, in, in skeletal muscle, this is the primary activator in the sense that it flips the switch. LKB1 phosphorylates AMPK turning it on, flipping that switch, turning on AMPK. But it can only do it after AMP is bound. After AMP is bound to the gamma subunit, you see a bunch of AMPs over here. Uh, well, there's an ADP also, ADP or ATP um, combined. It's that ratio determines this. So there's an ADP, there's a couple of AMPs. Once you've bound your AMP to the gamma subunit, that allows LKB1 to turn on AMPK. If you have AMP or ADP bound to that gamma subunit, 
the phosphatases can't turn it off. If you bind ATP to that gamma subunit, remember a phosphatase removes the phosphate. A kinase attaches the phosphate. A phosphatase removes a phosphate. So LKB1, liver kinase B1, attaches a phosphate, which turns it off. You need a phosphate to come in here, or a phosphatase to come in here and take that phosphate off. If you have ATP bound to the gamma subunit, you can do that. You can shut it off. AMP and ADP, it's hard to shut off your AMPK. Energy stress, remember, is your ratio of ATP to the other ones. That ratio determines what gets bound to your AMPK. Which one of those is bound to your AMPK? And then again, once AMPK is active, uh, you're seeing OP1 um, and FOXO. Let's get some autophagy going. Uh, you're seeing inhibition of mTOR through tuberin and through raptor. And there's at least one study um, that shows uh, phosphorylation of, of mTOR directly. Uh, this is a phosphatase right here, uh, P10. It's a, it doesn't actually block PI3K. That, that's not a very good arrow. Um, remember what PI3K does is it takes PIP2 and converts it to PIP3. Phosphatase intense and homolog, P10. This takes uh, PIP3 and converts it to PIP2. That's a phosphatase. Um, and so there's regulation with mTOR, but AMPK, that's the primary negative regulator. That's the primary inhibitor of mTOR is AMPK, arguably the single most catabolic enzyme in your body. And remember, enzymes do the work. Enzymes really do the work. People talk about, people who don't know physiology talk about hormones. Oh, you know, testosterone or growth hormone or whatever. People who are really having more intimate relationship with physiology, understand that the enzymes are what are, are what are doing, and the hormones are just facilitating enzymatic reactions. And there's a lot of ways to facilitate those enzymatic reactions. A lot of ways with supplements, a lot of ways with uh, nutrition, a lot of ways with exercise programming. There's a lot of ways to interact with your enzymes. AMPK is one of those enzymes. You can interact with this one. If you want to be hypertrophic, if you want to grow, if you want to do a bunch of protein translation, shut off AMPK, and that will permit hypertrophy. That will permit uh, strength. That will permit uh, human performance in a, a muscular sense. Now, if you shut off AMPK, you're going to be a worse aerobic athlete. AMPK is about the best thing you can get for aerobics. Stuff that activates AMPK, an AMP mimetic, for example, these things get like banned. These are illegal in endurance sports. I'm like the Tour de France. These are illegal. What do they do? Well, if they're activating AMPK, it's making you a weak ass. It's stopping recovery and regeneration of your, of your cells. It's, stopped, it's completely abolishing hypertrophy. Um, it's turning on atrophy, but also all of this stuff is good for aerobic metabolism, mitochondrial biogenesis among it. Um, and so again, so you know, you know this, energetic stress, we're seeing AMPK, there's a raptor uh, interaction, there's a tuberin interaction, part of its role is through uh, mTOR in terms of its abolishing of anabolism, AMPK. So, you know, fats, you know, carbs, you know, protein. We'll start digging a little bit deeper into the AMPK stuff now. And we'll finish AMPK. We'll do a complete overview of AMPK uh, today. Sort of a brief, complete overview. And then we'll do a little more detail work of AMPK uh, next lecture and an introduction to some of the applications. Then we'll finish up the applications after that. But remember, combining all of these inputs, nutrients, we're thinking really protein. There's the, the RAG A, that's what gets GTP loaded. Um, so I think protein, you need these amino acids. 
uh, to get lysosomal translocation, to, to escort mTOR to the lysosome, that primary workstation, you need protein to do that. Insulin is just shown over here, uh, but growth factors. You need growth factors. You need PI3K, PKD signaling, MEPK, sure. Um, you need growth factors, myokines, um, you know, insulin would work. Uh, I mean, you're, you're gonna be testosterone is gonna have secondary effects. You need growth factors to do these uh, PI3K, PKB uh, signals so you can get REB to activate mTOR only if it's at the work site. You need both protein and growth factors to do it. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's Gringotts Bank. You need two keys to open that vault. You're not going to get into Lady Lestrange over here, Bellatrix Lestrange. She can't get into her vault with just one key, with mTOR. Right, you can't turn this thing on with one pathway. You need two pathways to turn this thing on. Um, and uh, AMPK, getting more into the detail here, there are tons of effects. You see its results in the, in the hypothalamus over here. AMPK affects the hypothalamus. And we'll talk about what that means at the very end uh, of today. Um, the heart, adipose tissue, the liver, the pancreas, skeletal muscle, everything it's doing is attempting to get your ATP back, balance that energy stress, reverse that energy stress. So in the hypothalamus, the way to interact with energy stress is to put food in your mouth. Activate AMPK in the hypothalamus and you want to eat. Um, Adipose tissue, where it's blocking fatty acid synthesis, but it's also um, turning on um, catabolism, turning on lipolysis. It's turning on glycolysis. It's turning on proteolysis, protein lysis. Lots of lysolar stuff. Very catabolic, and it's also turning off mTOR. So, in with all of the work that is doing, phosphorylates reactor that inhibits reactor. So AMPK, remember MAPK is going to promote raptor. AMPK inhibits raptor. Raptor is required for mTOR to do its uh, kinasing, to do its phosphorylating. The kinase activity of mTOR, raptor uh, is required for it to do that. And AMPK inhibits raptor. AMPK promotes tuberin. You don't need to write this down. This is just phosphorylated sites. It doesn't matter. Uh, but AMPK promotes tuberin. So it prevents REB from activating. It's not enough that AMPK shuts off mTOR at Raptor. It needs to really eliminate its, its uh, activity. And so it, it duplicates its inhibition by promoting tuberin. And then also, um, this study, all these studies, this, this is going to be the biggest um, file folder of the semester, probably. You don't need to read the studies, but if you're interested in learning more about any particular slide, whatever study is on the slide, you can find those in the, in the folder. And there's going to be like, I don't know, 20 or something <laughs> uh, PDFs in, in this file folder. Um, but this study showed a, a direct mTOR uh, phosphorylation, and several subsequent studies have just accepted that. Uh, I haven't seen another study that duplicated the effect. Everyone has just sort of accepted it. Uh, so there's limited evidence here, but the main interactions with AMPK are, uh, interactions with mTOR are through tuberin and raptor. Those are the two major points. Those seem to be the two major points through which AMPK shuts off mTOR. Now, St. Peter, what does St. Peter do? What does St. Peter do in like a far side comic, like a Gary Larson definition of St. Peter? What is, what is St. Peter's role? He opens the gates to heaven. <laughs> he the gates to heaven. Oh, says, what's your team? It's uh, six Sorry, it's six Oh, which we'll talk about uh, that in a little bit. Um, by two, so three S by two. Um, Opens the gates of heaven. So he tells you, St. Peter, 
in this very crude definition of St. Peter's role, tells you, um, we just go through the room, just excuse my definition, this is just take this as meaningless. Okay, I'll send you to heaven. Yeah. Okay, you're going to hell. I'm sorry, I still have Alex, yeah, go to hell. Uh, Nathaniel, you can go to hell. You know, if, if you just go through Natalie, go ahead and follow Nathaniel. Uh, so if, if we just go through the room and say, like, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, um, that's like St. Peter. And and PK can be thought of as St. Peter of a kind. He tells a cell. I, we're sort of anthropomorphizing A and PK. And it's apparently a he. Um, he tells the cell, you're anabolic or you're catabolic. Now, a lot of literature will call this a metabolic master switch, right? There's a study, it's not in this slideshow, maybe I'll put it in the next slideshow, um, that talks about yin yang, right? So it's this, this relationship of, um, I believe, good and evil and um, some balance of light and dark. Or something. Um, and so there are references throughout the literature of this um, cardinal means a hinge, as A and PK is sort of this cardinal, sort of this hinge of, of whether you're anabolic or whether you are catabolic. And so A and PK is turning on pathways that promote energy, turning on pathways that stimulate, that promote, that increase ATP, generation of ATP. A and PK is turning that off. A and PK is turning off things that consume energy. It's turning off stuff that consumes energy. So the way you turn it on, we have ATP hydrolysis over here, right? ATP plus water, your ATP ACE, ACE enzyme. Um, so we're gonna break down our ATP, we're gonna ADP out of it, and a phosphate, a hydrogen ion. Um, so you go through ATP hydrolysis, you're exercising, right? You're broccoli doing pull-ups, you're carrot doing squats, you're running, whatever it is you're doing, it's soccer, it's tennis, it's whatever, you're exercising, all of that metabolism is paid for by ATP. So you generate a bunch of ADP. When you generate a bunch of ADP, you have to do something with that ADP. The adenylate kinase reaction, not adenylate cyclase, which is what takes ATP and converts into cyclic AMP, but adenylate kinase takes two ADPs and makes one ATP and one AMP out of them, adenylate kinase. Now we get ATP back and we generate a lot of AMP. We start generating a whole bunch of AMP, AMP as well as ADP or ATP, if, that's, if you have a bunch of ATP, there's the gamma subunit of AMPK. Once you get a, enough AMP built up and you bind it here, that permits again LKB1 to phosphorylate the alpha subunit, which turns it on. Now it's active and, and AMP can, can do its phosphorylating, can do its kinase activity. The beta subunit down here, glycogen binds to that one. If you have an abundance of glycogen, glycogen binds to the beta subunit. But the ratio, right here it says ratio of AMP to ATP, that ratio determines whether your AMPK is active. At rest, you don't have much AMP at rest. At rest, you have a bunch of ATP. Okay, you, these can activate it too, but in skeletal muscle, LKD1, that's um, if AMPK was a, was a he, let's make LKD1 a she. Uh, she phosphorylates the, the in muscle, in skeletal muscle, she uh, does the phosphorylating, does the activating of um, uh, AMPK. Uh, but if you have a ton of carbs, you can, you can inhibit AMPK because AMPK is an energy sensor. If it's not sensing how much carbohydrate you have, it's not doing its full job. It's cutting its job short a little bit. Because remember, AMPK facilitates GLUT4 translocation. AMPK facilitates glucose entry into the cell in the place of insulin. AMPK will get sugar into the cell. Unlike insulin, which is going to uh, stimulate glycogen synthesis, AMPK is gonna turn on glycolysis, and PFK and hexokinase. 
AMPK needs to know if it's doing this stuff, if it's taking carbs out of the blood and bringing them into the cell and it's burning your carbohydrate, it needs to know how much carbohydrate you have. So carbs, um, complex carbs, glycogen can bind to that beta uh, subunit. Now ADP is important too. ADP is important too. Um, in most of the work you see, you know, high levels of ADP also protect against activation loop dephosphorylation. Remember these phosphatases can deactivate um, AMPK uh, five to 10 times less potently than AMP. Other studies say ADP is more important than that. The AMP activated protein kinase, think AMP is critical to the stimulation, to the activation of AMPK. ADP is important too. ADP is important too. ATP inhibits, ADP and AMP both promote. AMP is the biggest promoter out of AMP and uh, uh, ADP. So again, AMPK is also sensing carbohydrates. AMPK is also sensing uh, carbohydrates. So this is the review of everything so far with AMPK. ATP hydrolysis happens. You exercise, you get some ATP hydrolysis. Whatever you do, right now you're doing ATP hydrolysis. Whatever it is you're doing, the more metabolically active you are, the more ATP hydrolysis you're doing. Remember in cross-bridge cycling, muscle activity, every power stroke, every cross-bridge, sliding filament theory, those sliding filaments are acting in myosin, each cross-bridge um, they form uh, acting in myosin. Each one of those power strokes consumes an ATP. ATP, 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 and that's just one myosin. ATP, 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 consuming it. You consume a ton of ATP during exercise. That adenylic kinase reaction can take two ADPs and create one ATP and one AMP out of it. I'll just take from one and give to the other. Um, so, you know, again, like an inverse Robin Hood. We have all middle class. Let's make rich and poor out of it. Uh, ATP and AMP, ADP2, compete for binding at the gamma subunits. AMP turns on, ATP turns off. ATP inhibits, AMP permits. If you have AMP bound, it permits LKD1 to activate AMPK. AMP and ADP, if those remain bound to that gamma subunit, you can't dephosphorylate your AMPK. So it remains on. So you're continuing to exercise. You're on the treadmill for two hours or whatever, continuing to exercise. Your energy stress, your AMP levels may continue to be elevated for a while. It's going to be difficult to shut off your AMPK, to deactivate, dephosphorylate your AMPK. So things that are going to turn on AMPK, exercise, you're going to turn on AMPK. Hypoxia, just get in like a um, hypobaric chamber or go up the mountain or whatever. Go up in altitude. Start climbing Everest and then start exercising on <laughs> Everest. Uh, starvation or glucose deprivation. You're going to have energy stress there. Exercise in the presence of altitude. Exercise in the presence of energy deficits. Fast and go exercise while fasting. You're going to be turning on AMPK. Yeah, Caffeine is fascinating. Um, can we can we stop there with caffeine is fascinating? <laughs> caffeine. I, I would stare blankly at the ceiling for like eight minutes to try to think through all the pathways of caffeine. Off the top of my head, off the inside of where my brain lives, off the inside of my head. Um, I, if there's an effect with caffeine and AMPK, it's not the, a primary effect um, of how AMPK works, how caffeine works. Um, we'll talk more about, we can talk more about caffeine and its effects later. <laughs> but caffeine is one of few supplements where people have better um, anaerobic performances, people have better aerobic performance. It sort of enhances everything. If there's a panacea of supplements, if there's sort of a, a 
Um, ergogenic panacea, caffeine is that thing. So here's AMP again, this is my like scribbly drawing. LKB1, we're gonna turn it on at the alpha subunit. Uh, ATP versus AMP ratio, that's the gamma subunit. And that really determines whether LKB1 can turn it on. Glycogen binds to the beta subunit. Let's sense carbohydrates. In addition to general energy stress, let's sense carbohydrate levels. Now what AMPK does, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, that's what those scribbles say. So that's really helpful. GLUT4 translocated, really helpful for aerobic metabolism. GLUT4 translocation, let's get carbs into the cell. Um, adipose triglyceride lipase, hormone sensitive lipase. These are uh, lipolytically stimulating uh, enzymes. And so let's, let's activate that stuff. Let's get lipolysis going. Uh, PFK and hexokinase, let's get glycolysis going. Let's inhibit glycogen synthase. So all of these, and that's not everything, but that's a, a pretty comprehensive picture of what AMPK is doing. But remember, it is also, over here we have mTOR. We're inhibiting mTOR. And what you see in this diagram is tuberin and raptor. Um, let's turn on tuberin and let's inhibit raptor. But over here, we're seeing FOXO and OLP1 protein degradation on that side. You remember the ubiquitin proteasome system, we'll go over that, lysosomal degradation. AMPK is turning off mTOR, it's turning, on, it's turning off protein synthesis and turning on protein degradation. Now, uh, you should recognize pretty much everything on here except for these. Uh, metformin, I think you know this pathway, um, resveratrol and ICAR, A-I-C-A-R, uh, this is an AMP mimetic. Uh, metformin, you know what it does, we'll cover it quickly, and then resveratrol also. Uh, actually, let's have this be the last slide, and then I'll explain these in the next lecture when we wrap up AMPK and begin to introduce applications. But LKB1 turns on AMPK at the uh, alpha site. Uh, beta, right, that's where your glycogen binds. Gamma, that's where uh, ATP, ADP, AMP binds. AMPK would be turning on tuberin. It would be shutting off uh, Raptor. Over here, we have that PI3K, PKB signaling. Um, there's AMPK with FOXO. You don't see old one over here, but um, there's, you know, the tuberous sclerosis complex, and there's REV and mTOR, PRAS40, Raptor, 4EBP1, uh, P70, SSK. ICAR, AMP, mimetic. It mimics AMP, so it permits LKB1's activation. Uh, metfor let's do resveratrol assists in the activation of AMPK from LKB1. Resveratrol is a thing in wine, in red wine or in grapes. You know, in wine, you got grapes. They feel like wine is so healthy because it has resveratrol, right? Enables, uh, helps LKB1's activation of AMPK. And then metformin, Cameron, do you remember metformin's? You answered it last time in the semester. AMPDMase. Blocks AMPDMase. What's your team? Three. What the? Uh, what's the? Ractamize. Ractamize it. Um, 0.029. Uh, so if you block AMPDMase, remember you get a bunch of AMP built up during exercise. ATP hydrolysis and then adenylate kinase. Now you have a bunch of AMP. You have to dispose of that AMP. You don't just build it up, you have to dispose of it. AMP deaminase, yeah, inosine monophosphate pneumonia. If you block AMP deaminase, you accumulate AMP. If you accumulate AMP, the ratio of ATP to AMP changes. That AMP binds permits the activation of LKB1. So metformin, that diabetes drug, does a lot of things. Among those things it does, it promotes uh, the activation of AMPK by increasing levels of AMP, which changes the ATP to AMP ratio, which permits LKB1 to activate it. So AMPK is on, AMPK increases uh, the intake of carbohydrate, of glucose, and the burning of those sugars inside of the cell through glycolysis. And shuts off anabolism, and let's end that. We'll finish up AMPK and catabolism, negative regulation of mTOR, next lecture, and we'll introduce applications, things you can do. And we'll two lectures on that subject.
go do go do Wednesday things.